the other side, Gary, before the, yeah. Uh, which tells us something of the defeat of the goddess in Europe. Here in these two beautiful vase paintings, uh, we, you know, we find there are two myths here uh, that if we can decode them, we can learn something of what happened to that splendid Minoan culture. Uh, the myth tells us about this minotaur, a um, horrible beast, uh, uh, half man, half bull, uh, born of, out of the passion of his mother, the queen, for a beautiful bull from the sea, who was kept, they said, in this labyrinthian uh, um, dungeon that had been built uh, to hide uh, this shameful thing. And uh, he demanded uh, uh, homage from uh, the Athens every year. They had to send uh, young men and young women for him to eat. That's the only thing that he wanted. Uh, Theseus, the story goes, came and uh, killed through some ruse, uh, killed the Minotaur. And so there you see the killing of the Minotaur. Actually, uh, there probably never was such a story. What was the la when we finally came to excavate this palace, we found that what the labyrinth, this d red dungeon labyrinth, was really just the way the many passages and uh, corridors of the palace itself that was built into a hillside. So uh, this is the kind of story that a victor of one culture uh, tells to uh, justify his uh, conquest. And here you see Europa and the bull. The myth, the story is that Zeus, Europa, who gave her name to the continent of Europe, that Europa um, was very beautiful. She was out in the meadow one day, and Zeus desired her, so he changed himself into a bull, kidnapped her, and carried her off. So uh, Zeus was the uh, sky god, and this was the end then uh, of the goddess culture. Uh, of the full flowering of the goddess culture in Europe. Next to, uh, let's just uh, go on, uh, okay. Um, all right, in trying to explain what happened, uh, I want to quickly run through some familiar images from Christianity because uh, we know uh, the problem was, uh, because I want to make the connection now between the demise of the goddess culture and the problem for uh, human women. Uh, one of the uh, things that uh, we have to, uh, that has been so hard for women in Western culture, the Judeo-Christian culture, has been that female sexuality and female bodies are evil. And so I want to go back a minute and look at the, some uh, pictures that will give us this sequence. And you see on the uh, right there the fateful event in the Garden of Eden when Eve ate the apple and they were banished. Uh, the uh, coming of the Virgin Mary in um, Christianity was as the new Eve. It was she who would bear the Christ child in her pure immaculate womb and then in this way would help to atone for the original sin which all humankind had been uh, condemned to. Next. Uh, the, uh, in the iconography, in the symbol system associated with the Virgin Mary, uh, incorporated many of the uh, notions, the ideas, the symbols of the goddess culture. So we see Mary here uh, nurturing, uh, uh, nursing the Christ child, uh, much as uh, the Egyptian goddess Isis nursed her son Horus. Uh, like uh, Mary, uh, Isis was the uh, mother of a uh, divine son who also would be a savior. Next. Uh, the, uh, the key to Mary's role was her pure immaculate womb. So like the uh, goddess of old, she was, it was her body that was the vessel out of which all life would come. And in this very uh, popular medieval iconography, we see her as the throne on which the Christ child would sit. This too is taken from Egyptian culture. Uh, the pharaoh would sit on the goddess's lap in Egyptian culture. The Virgin was uh, singularly honored as no other woman in Western culture. She was in these two paintings, uh, which uh, 
are of two, the two most recent uh, papal um, annunciates. For and one is for the Immaculate Conception. You see her there standing on the moon, her head ringed by stars. This is certainly a cosmic image. And on the right is the uh, is her death, in which her body she's carried up into heaven in bodily form, which no other human include. This this is the assumption of the Virgin, including her son, ever um, had next to, so that she is a, a special human being. So what then is the problem for uh, human women, as, for the virgin as a model? And while she is the queen of heaven, and as we see her in this beautiful stained glass window from Chart, uh, the uh, artist Marisol has made this uh, sculpture of the Holy Family and pointing out to what the problem is. And there you see her uh, with her pure immaculate womb is uh, jeweled and enameled and it's loose side, it opens up, uh, but she has no body. All she has is hands that are three-dimensional, feet and a face. And the Christ child is there uh, in a cradle, a uh, loose side cradle, and Joseph, uh, well, he just has a face with some hands. So the problem then for the uh, Virgin Mary as the sacred female in Western culture is that she is asexual, so that there is no way then for a woman in Western culture, uh, whether she's Christian or not, uh, we live in a Judeo-Christian culture, there's no way for a woman to be uh, fully sexual, <coughs> virtuous, and powerful all at the same time. Uh, the culmination of these attitudes, or this uh, uh, perhaps the, was, the, was a holocaust which took place from the 15th to 18th century in which uh, perhaps a million, perhaps uh, as some people have said as many as nine million uh, people were burned uh, as witches, burned, tortured, and put to death. And here in this uh, German print we see uh, the witch's Sabbath. Uh, it's almost uh, beyond, uh, if we hadn't just lived through another holocaust in a uh, recent time, it would be almost impossible to imagine how there could have been this crazed madness in which women uh, were blamed for uh, consorting with the devil, uh, Satan, and uh, their li they were deprived of their life and livelihood, tortured, uh, many died in prison, or others died of uh, just of the hardships. And you'll see in the drawing uh, there, the other print, uh, that is the fear of the womb. Is that's from a medieval manuscript. And there you see, this is, called, this is what the, the enormous fear of the power of the womb. And when I think, when I, again, about the politics of what I'm talking about, uh, the fact is that uh, today, uh, when we are in the middle of a crisis, uh, as far as uh, the, uh, free choice, uh, uh, the whole, what, a woman's right to have control of her own body, it would seem once again that we're, uh, there is some fear some that underlies uh, the, so much of our culture about the power uh, that there is in a woman's body to create life. But we should look at it another kind of way, which is that this is a power which is uh, that which can enrich all of our lives, and every woman doesn't have to use this power. She doesn't have to be a mother. We have more than enough um, children and more than enough population in the world. But this creative energy within is something that uh, is, a, is a wonderful gift. So uh, it's not the, I'm being simplistic in a way, but these, uh, this art speaks very tellingly of what the conflicts and problems are. This was from the uh, 16th century, but uh, there are many attitudes that haven't changed since then. Next two. This is the story of Lilith, and Lilith uh, is a, this is a uh, ancient image, some 5,000 years old, and Lilith here looks like a, is decked out in the crown and the um, regalia of Sumerian royalty, but in uh, what has happened, she obviously was very respected then, and she's standing on two lines. Notice again, she has bird feet, and she's uh, uh, attended by these two owls. Uh, what happened to Lilith 
who is uh, we know about from uh, the ancient Sumerian hymns, and we also next hear about her in the uh, literature of the uh, Jewish exile, where she has become a demoness. And the things that uh, that she does is that she causes men to have wet dreams, that is, to have this, uh, to have sexual thoughts, and she smothers infants in their cribs. So the kinds of fears then that she represents are those fears projected out, the things that men and women both are afraid of, of being too freely sexual. This is from a, uh, a pot from uh, Boeotia in the uh, Greek, uh, in about 8th century. And you'll see the fish there inside the womb of the goddess. The fish was a symbol for the uh, fertility of the goddess. But what has happened to the fish in uh, the uh, vulgar language or common, is that the fish now represents something very negative about a female. Uh, a woman from Brazil told me how uh, she, when she was a little girl, she didn't like to take a bath, and her uh, brother said to her, if you don't take a bath, you'll smell like uh, a fish. And then he said to her, the water used to be sweet in the ocean until a woman took a bath in it. So in the uh, vulgar parlance, uh, the smell of fish is the smell of female uh, genital fluids. All of the uh, language, or most of the language associated with female, uh, the sacred parts of a woman's body have become uh, obscene language. Uh, as a result of all of this, we have, oh, I want to take another look here at what's going on in the representation of women. Uh, women have become, uh, the, in their representation, in Western art, in Western advertising, uh, they are an object of desire or a medium through which things are sold. And in this amusing cartoon there, you see the painter, in order to be a painter, all he needs is a palette, some brushes, and a nude model. Or as the surrealist Magritte says, what the painting is about is just framing a woman's body. Next. Marilyn, the, another way in which a woman's body has been objectified is in the pinup, and this is Marilyn Monroe. And uh, she, uh, one of the sad thing about, this is the famous pinup that uh, began her career, and the sad thing is that she died really uh, later on, unable, committed suicide, unable to make a human connection that would sustain her. Next. Another, Magritte made this painting uh, in the 30s called Rape and suggested uh, playfully that when a man looks at a woman's uh, face, he sees her body. Uh, the New York artist Eunice Golden uh, wasn't being playful when she made this uh, drawing called Rape and she suggested this is what a woman sees uh, when she goes down a street late at night and uh, there, some unknown man is coming towards her. Barbara Kruger uh, made this poster for the um, right pro-choice, right to life, uh, pro-choice rally in uh, Washington last year, and which she says, your body is a battleground. The connection that I'm making here is between uh, sacred female, uh, the understanding of this, and the uh, total uh, violation and abuse of this in our culture, which doesn't hold uh, women's bodies, doesn't, doesn't know a sacred divine female, and the importance of having a symbol and image for this in our culture. Here you, uh, what in uh, Mary Frank's sculpture there, uh, which that we have, uh, that's Persephone. So uh, she made this uh, beautiful sculpture. Is that upside down, Jerry? Can you, well, I can't tell. Anyway, Frank made this when uh, her daughter was, her grown daughter was killed. And, but what it suggests is the fragmentation that women often feel. And Gail Bryan, uh, uh, is, a photographer, has 
superimposed one photograph over another here uh, to suggest the kind of the total alienation that she felt. She uh, said that she had just left a marriage, a long marriage, and had uh, changed careers and uh, was uh, living in a way utterly different than that of the way in which she'd been brought up and that she didn't know who she was. She was going to art school uh, studying photography and her task was to do a series of self-portraits and she said it was six weeks before she could even begin to take a picture and then uh, what she's done here is put one on top of another and what she said is that this, these are the masks that she wears. Next two. And this is another one of showing Brian's anguish. Go on. And alienation. So that for women, the recovery of goddess imagery uh, has given them a, uh, not only a uh, support, but also a uh, place in which to find some identity. And this is one way in which the Mexican artist Frida Kahlo, uh, uh, who's called the patrona of feminist artists, uh, expressed her feeling about her own identity. She was part European, part Mexican, and there you see, she's very proud of her Mexican heritage, and you see her as a child woman uh, with a woman's face being nurtured by uh, this Aztec, uh, Olmec goddess. Uh, very beautifully, she's made a parallel there between the uh, milk, it, that is the stars and the heavens and the beautiful flowers of milk in the mammillary gland and the white veins in the leaf. And Marianne Ferrello uh, calls this portrait face of hers shrouded memory. She can dimly remember. It's there somewhere when there was a, uh, the, a powerful, sacred female to relate to, but she hasn't fully found it. That's why her face is still chained to a bird there. Next two. Women began to do ritual. In this, Mary Beth Edelson went to a cave in Yugoslavia, and Anna Mendieta uh, covered herself with mud, raised her hands, remembered the figure from Egypt. Uh, she's against a tree, and a tree is one more symbol for the goddess. Uh, Mendieta was Cuban born and exiled in the United States, very much missing her native land, and she continued to do rituals, all of which had to do with earth, fire, and water. Next. This is one with fire. Next. And here you see she went back to her native Cuba and she, there in a cave uh, west of Havana, sacred to the goddess, she once more, as in the ancient uh, worlds uh, in prehistory, carved out these sacred uh, images in the proportion and shape of her body. Now, Mendieta was killed or died in a tragic accident, but uh, she, more than any of the women who are making this art, has been able to express something of the power of the ancient world still in a contemporary image. Next two. And here we have Margot Machida in New York, uh, just having come to live there from Hawaii, scared stiff, evoking the memory of the Minoan snake goddess. Next. Uh, this is mine red Craighead on uh, the right, a former Benedictine nun who uh, sees herself, she calls this garden. And this is both a tree, it's her body uh, with the uh, ovaries and the uh, infant inside in the uterus and in a splendid world all filled with birds and flowers and uh, things that are growing of richness it's like a tapestry and Dina Metzger again takes the shape of a tree this is called tree she had a mastectomy and she speaks of the healing that it was for her when she had a flowering branch tattooed on her breast Next. There should be another one on this side. No? I want to finish. With, no, that's, there's a whole series of them in there before this. 
and I want to finish with that. No, your way. I'd like to, what I want to, the point, if we can, well, this is George O'Keefe, and I guess there are several more images I want to show, and I want to conclude with this. Uh, O'Keefe, who's probably the mo most famous American woman painter, painted flowers. This is one of them. Uh, she uh, staunchly denied that they had any, that there was any meaning in them beyond uh, what she called them. She would name, this one is yellow, blue, and purple. But um, they have been seen as a very inviting inner woman space. Uh, she uh, didn't always uh, protest so much. Uh, in her early letters, she wrote about trying with everything in her to create a painting that represented uh, her feeling of herself as a woman. Can we get the, there are some back here, Gary. Can we get them? No, go back. Are you reversing? They're quite, it's quite, back yet. They're not going down, I guess. They're, all right, there is a hole. I'm sorry. Uh, well, then just give the other one over here on this side. Uh, this is Judy Chicago. Judy Chicago uh, is the most courageous of these artists who make uh, the art, which is recovering the sacred female. And she has paid a heavy price for this. Uh, this is a uh, drawing that she did in the early 70s, and she calls it the cunt as flower, temple, cave, or tomb. And uh, I would not have been able to say cunt out loud like this in front of all of you, probably even 10 years ago. And as I've come to realize that it, what it means, I mean, it has, it's a perfectly honorable word describing a sacred part of a woman's body. But when I tried to show this slide on a television program in Los Angeles, uh, at the last minute, the producer came and yanked it off the screen, telling me that it's against the law to use such a word on television. And I thought then of the violence that we see in television all the time. And uh, there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, I just wanted to close with Louise Bourgeois, if you can get her, Gary. She's here. No. Okay, now can you get the one that goes with it on this side? Well, here we see Louise Bourgeois, who is the preeminent uh, woman sculptor in uh, America, probably in the Western world. She's having a, a show that's touring all of Europe now. And she, for her retrospective at the Museum of Modern Art, she got herself up like this. Uh, Artemis of Ephesus, a Roman goddess from the uh, Near East, and uh, she's a, 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 an American, but originally a French woman, and very much in touch with her own inner space, her inner psyche, and all of her work directly comes out of that. Let's have the, there should, let's see what's on the next, no, wait a minute, yeah. Uh, okay, here are two, no, that's what I want, Gary, these are two of her pieces. The one on the uh, right is some 25 years or so earlier than the one on the left. She calls the one on the right fragile goddess, and she made it when she was pregnant. And she talks of her anxiety, her fear, her terror that she wouldn't be adequate to being a mother. Uh, the one on the left she calls death of the father. And this is only a piece of an 18-foot long sculpture. And when I uh, saw this exhibited at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, I didn't understand it. I only really came, well, I thought that that poor woman, she's had a hard time with her father, and she's made this enormous, it's made, it's 18 feet long, made of plastic and light, plaster and latex, and uh, it looked like a giant jaw in some ways. And when I was struggling to finish my book, and really struggling, it was one of the hardest things I could do, it came to me, uh, why, what this was about. And what I realized was that the reason I was having such a hard time finishing my book was because of all the radical things I was saying in it, and that uh, what was um, freezing me, paralyzing me, was my own internalized fear 
of the um, of going against the uh, authorities, the academic ones, the culture that I had been raised in. And then I thought, well, what Bourgeois is saying here is that not about the death of her father, but the death of all patriarchy. And that what this is, is this is the interior of the womb, of the uterus. And indeed, I've checked this out with some medical people. This is what a, a uterus, particularly one that's either in menstruation or pregnant, looks like inside when all this tissue is engorged with blood. Uh, so that for bourgeois, uh, the, uh, again, the, the shift, this paradigm shift I'm talking about, for women and for men also, will uh, mean that if we can go beyond the uh, patriarchal mode in which we all live, in the assertive, aggressive, dominant, uh, competitive way, uh, that uh, that's that's what she's working for. There's one more slide, Gary, at the very end. Can you get to that one? I want to. No, that's the one. That, no, just yeah, shut the other light off if you can. Except that I need the light on in order to read this. I want to close with this because this is by Judith Anderson, a printmaker, and this is called Missagaya. And uh, many of the uh, women artists who are working with this have uh, made images now. They themselves work as healers. They do ritual. And uh, what they're interested in is evoking the powers of this iconography, these images that I showed you, to heal the earth. And Anderson calls this one Missagaya. This is my body. The earth, the grasses, the seas, and the infinite variety of creatures are her body, incarnations of her being and creativity, and all return home to her womb in death, dismemberment, extinction. In the undisturbed rhythm of earth, life, and death are intertwined and balanced in a vast exchange of lives. But in this ending, uh, in this etching, the brooding figure of the Great Mother echoes that of the Virgin Mary in the Pieta. Knees uh, wide in the birthing posture, she gently holds in pity, love, and anguish a glorious lifeless body, flesh of her flesh. The Great Mother surrounded by and filled with animals and bodies at once both celebration and profound grief and anger. Can I have the lights? I've gone on much too long, and thank you for being patient. But I'm happy to answer some questions. No questions? Comments? Yes? I just have something to, to share with you and then maybe a question following. Um, I was talking on the Tuesday uh, about some research. I've been doing about uh, mothering. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, that's why it's so important for us to uh, give voice to our feelings because there are many people who feel this. It isn't just women. Uh, men also are victimized by uh, this distortion. And I'm not really speaking against people's faith, but I'm really trying in this way to uh, make some connections that I've come to understand as I've uh, looked at this material for so many years. 
Without some kind of a what? With, with some kind of oppressiveness. I mean, how, how is difference tolerated within this oneness? Can you imagine, this is, again, these are different models of being in the world and those in which we know, that, one, that, there is, that we can be one as human and still pluralistic? Because that's the kind of culture that we're going to have to live in. We're going to live in our, we'll, we're already, uh, the majority of people in the United States are no longer white and we have many different strains. We used to think of ourselves as a melting pot, but that's no longer the model. Now we have, we're going, we're trying, or many peoples are, certainly the Native Americans and the Asians and others are trying to find room in our culture for their culture. So I think the only way I can think about how one can do this is to honor the human dignity in everyone else and to be enriched by this. And always, instead of always seeing everything in opposition and dualistic, to rather think of things that we're, our lives are enriched by other people who do things differently. Does that answer? No, well, I do not yes, quite. I have sympathy with that point of view, but there's a tendency to think of when there's one that there's the one. Oh, well, which, is, not the other, one, which is the other one. Oh, so the one absorbs everything and it's all the same in one same wish. No, rather, perhaps the language is a real problem because the language has associations which I don't necessarily intend. I don't think I said that I think of this as one, but rather the interconnection of all of life. Uh, this is, so it, it's very Buddhist in some way because in Buddhism you honor all of every sentient being, including every blade of grass. You're concerned about that. This is something the Dalai Lama, for instance, expresses this. It's so interesting, not that, uh, that I'm really, that this is a purely Buddhist, but it is a Buddhist way of seeing that everything is alive, every rock, every stone, every grass, every tree, every flower, every bird, and that there is some life spirit in all of this which is in me as well. And by me, I mean you too. So that I couldn't have said this uh, when I was writing the book. It's interesting what happens when you write a book like this and speak on it so often, that uh, you then grow even with the materials of somebody else's book that I read. And so, but I now really have come to internalize this business of the fact that I am the earth and the earth is me, I am the tree and the tree is me, and yet I'm not, I know I'm separate from the tree, but something of that, of this, uh, and it isn't, and I'm not talking about some profoundly transcendent thing, it's imminence inside of me, the sacredness. And that's one of the revelations of this, to understand that the sacred is not separate, it's in us. It, it might be easier to ask questions if they were more personal. Uh, there's a reception at the Women's Center, and you're all invited, and you can ask Eleanor questions now and talk to her individually, which might be easier than screaming out in a large room. So why don't you come ask your questions, and we can all walk over there together.